Welcome to 90 Minutes to Close the Loop. You're watching our fifth episode, the first of our second season. And after the success of the first year, we're looking forward to more debate and more engagement with the whole glass collection and recycling value chain. Once again, we're delighted to count on such a great participation with close to 230 registered attendees. For the first time, Portugal is not top of the list, despite a very strong attendance, and it is France that is our number one, maybe due to the fact that they hold the presidency of the EU in the first half of this year. It's also the first time that we welcome participants from Luxembourg, Uruguay, Japan, Iran, and Peru. So welcome to you if it's the first time that you are joining. Also good to see there is a lot of interest from across the value chain with a good distribution across brands, the waste management and recycling sector, extended producer responsibility, organizations, and the glass industry, of course. And this is good news as one of the objectives of this series is to propose content that can be relevant to the whole value chain. And today's episode is really packed with interesting content. Our main topic is looking at the EU end of waste criteria for glass, which celebrates its 10 years and has been an important regulatory pillar of the circular economy for glass packaging. The best practice presentation will take us to Madrid, where Pernod Ricard will give us details on its Recicla la Noche campaign. And finally, we'll have an open Q&A session on Close the Glass Loop. So if you have any questions about the platform, its activities, its ambitions, please send them through in Slido, which is where you can interact throughout the event. In fact, we have a poll now open asking you, how familiar are you with end of waste criteria? And it looks like we have an audience of knowledgeable practitioners with a working knowledge of end of waste. But to the others who know a bit less, rest assured, this is going to be a great opportunity to learn more. And we'll be also live tweeting and the tweets will be featured that with the hashtag 90 minutes CGL, they'll be appearing in the live stream. So do join the conversation on Twitter as well. So with all of this in mind, let's jump into the main topic and introduce our keynote speaker as the clock is ticking. So what's the story for Glass about end of waste? Well, I am joined by Emmanuel Katrakis, Secretary General of the European Recycling Industries Confederation. And Emmanuel will be giving us an overview of end of waste, its role in the context of the broader European climate agenda and circular economy agenda. And he has a very broad overview of the whole recycling sector. So it's going to be really interesting to hear from Emmanuel. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, and, a, and a quick uh, a quick unmute, Emmanuel. Sure. Despite yep. one year or two years now of, of COVID and online events, it's always something that I forgot. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be uh, with you this afternoon. I would like to thank, obviously, Jean-Paul and the organizers for the opportunity to speak today about um, end of waste. Uh, this is uh, an extremely, um, uh, extremely important topic and a topic that is going to make, I think, the uh, uh, the headlines in, in the in the months to come in relation to the uh, Green Deal and the New Circular Economy Action Plan. I'm going to go very quickly uh, through my presentation about who we are and why it matters, um, and eventually give a bit of uh, history on where we stand today when it comes to uh, end of waste and where we come from. So, um, in terms of introducing URIC, we are the European Recycling Confederation. We are based in Brussels. Um, we represent national recycling federations from across uh, Europe um, and we represent different streams. Uh, so um, from obviously metals, plastic, paper, textiles, tires, um, end of life vehicles, uh, batteries, um, to a certain extent and electronic waste, glass 
is not a part of our portfolio, uh, which is obviously represented by uh, Ferver when it comes to, to, to glass recycling and, and Feve, but we also work closely with, uh, with some uh, glass recyclers, and I'm extremely pleased to be here today to give an overview of, of end of waste in relation to uh, the current uh, developments. So we work as an association in different expert groups, uh, which are all extremely relevant, either rather technical ones when it comes to sustainable finance or standardization, uh, to uh, more policy oriented ones, um, and all have the same objective, transpose the um, uh, the, the new circular economy action plan into, into, into practice. So now if I go a bit further, and I'd like to start by, by that slide in terms of trying to set the scene, uh, recycling is an industry, it's a green industry, but we are an industry and our job, regardless of the materials that we uh, try to recycle and the techniques that are being used to, to recover those materials is to turn a waste into a new raw material that can substitute, uh, in most instances, primary raw materials and uh, basically by doing that, not only uh, brings some benefits or substantial benefits in terms of resource efficiency, but also in terms of energy and climate efficiency. So now when it comes to uh, basically where we stand today, despite the fact that Europe has an easy front runner when it comes to um, the policy making in relation to the circular economy, uh, when it comes also to waste management recycling. If we look at the big picture, um, only 12% of raw materials that are being used today by the industry uh, come from recycling. So basically we still have nearly 90% that do not come from recycling. Obviously we cannot always substitute primary and secondary material, but there is still a huge margin for improvement if we want to move towards circular value chains. Now, when we compare it to glass, glass is a, uh, I would say when we look at the statistics, an excellent performer, which has already quite uh, well functioning circular value chain. Glass is a material is made of, of materials that are easy to recycle when we compare it to all the materials and that, and also a very strong cooperation between on one hand, uh, collection, recycling and use of um, recycled glass to make new glass. So I think here we cannot put all the materials in the same basket, but when we look at the, at the, at the big picture, we still have quite a number of actually uh, room to improve circular value chains in Europe. So now where we come from, I think I'd like to, 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 to put that um, uh, slide always just to um, put into perspective the fact that uh, waste management uh, directives, recycling uh, directives, which are 30, 40 years old, um, resource efficiency uh, strategies, circular economy action plan, the first one being put forward, I think, back in 2015, have already been there for quite some time. Now, the difference, and this is why I think it's uh, so important, is the fact that the Green Deal, so moving towards a climate neutral um, uh, environment, and the circular economy are at the top of the political agenda. The first press conference that uh, the president of the commission uh, did was about the Green Deal uh, just after her uh, appointment in December 2019. And uh, I know it's not connected to the end of ways, but I think that illustrates pretty well the fact that it's such a, a priority when we look at uh, basically the, the new resources that the Commission is aiming at collecting to uh, basically pay back the recovery plan, we can see that three out of four of those new own resources are closely connected to environmental objectives. So either uh, a contribution on what is not recycled for plastic waste or uh, a basically contribution derived from the UETS or the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is uh, basically being um, discussed uh, right now. Now, end of waste, a bit of history. I think that's important to, to realize the fact that we are not speaking about a new concept. And, and this is for very simple reason. When we look at European legislation, we do have it's either black and white, you are either waste or you are not a waste. And then obviously the regulatory regime that comes with it and the rules obviously to ship uh, uh, your uh, materials are completely different. So the um, initial um, uh, criteria, the ones that are still valid today, uh, were first enacted uh, nearly 10 years ago 
And actually, I'm just here quoting the uh, all the, the previous commissioner for environment, Janis Potosnik, very well known, very knowledgeable person, who uh, basically to illustrate uh, end of waste and actually at that time even pushing for more end of waste criteria was saying that we the commission was aiming at developing new end of waste criteria in order to boost confidence in recycled materials. And I'll come back here at uh, the end of my presentation, but I think that's one element of why end of waste is important. One obviously is to have more clarity into the legal framework at as of which time in the value chain you cease to be a waste to be a product um, and that governs obviously the, the legal regime that comes with it and also to make sure that uh, the industry and uh, consumers do have confidence in uh, raw materials coming from uh, recycling. Now when we look at um, when we make now a jump of nearly 10 years so of seven years um, in between nothing really happened um, the the failure of end of waste for paper put a stop to to the commission ambition to to develop more end of waste criteria, unfortunately. But what we see, is, and actually even with the revision of the waste fund directive back into 2018, we saw that there was a kind of change in the paradigm where actually end of waste criteria. Um, in terms of responsibility were first the responsibility of member states and then the commission was monitoring the uptake of end of waste criteria uh, to see whether there is a need to have harmonization at European, at European level. But I think the new circular economy kind of changed a bit um, the order uh, by putting a few priorities linked to, to, to circular economy. I've only listed the one which uh, are very much in line with uh, what uh, Yuri has been supporting but when it comes to end of waste, it has been put, and I think it's the right category, into trying to create an EU market for secondary uh, raw material. And that is uh, strongly rooted with the fact that in an internal market where there are still um, the rules for waste classifications are harmonized at European level, but the interpretation vary, differ quite a lot among member states and sometimes even among regions of, of member states. And so end of waste is rightly put in the new circular economy action plan as a tool uh, basically to support the creation of such a markets for, for raw materials from recycling at European level and is also, though it's not part of the same paragraph, linked to standardization. And this is the second element. Market access requires obviously to have um, also a good quality uh, criteria to define which are those the quality that raw materials from recycling should meet to cease to be waste, which can be set either in harmonized standards or in technical specifications. And this is where actually the cooperation among the value chains, and this is where I think glass has been uh, an example, an outstanding example, is so important to make sure that when we define those criteria, there is a broader understanding between, on one hand, collection recycling and obviously circular value chains which are using those materials to make a new product. Now, the situation, I took the example of paper, but unfortunately there are many other examples to illustrate why it's so important to have more harmonized end of waste criteria is the fact that still today, if you want to ship arm, if you want to ship materials that have an harmonized quality between two member states, you may end up in a situation where you should not end up anymore. Uh, within the internal market, where one member state is going to classify it as a waste, another member state, and sometimes even the region is going to classify it as end of waste, and then it cross another body within the same countries. Here, I take Germany as, as an example, which has some end of waste criteria at regional level for paper, but not at federal level. Uh, then it's reclassified, reclassified as a waste, and I think this this shows that it's a real hindrance to to, to the internal market and uh, the need actually to go through uh, more harmonized uh, uh, stages. So I'm just reaching now the end of my presentation. I'm trying to be uh, rather short um, and to leave the floor to a more specific discussion linked to, to glass and end of waste. Um, why end of waste is important? Uh, first, I think we still face a kind of a contradiction uh, which is very much rooted within um, the European legal framework. Uh, we all agree that in a circular economy, waste is a resource, provided obviously it's, it's recycled, but we still classify 
uh, most we still classified waste as a waste and not as a, something when it has been recycled. It's either waste or a product, as I say. There is no category in between. Uh, there is no not a category for secondary raw materials or raw materials from recycling. You only have you are either a waste or a product. And we end up for other streams in situation where we have um, materials that have uh, basically which are meeting very stringent uh, quality standards, uh, which are directly usable in, in production facilities to substitute primary raw materials and which are still classified as a waste. And because of that, that actually plays as an impediment to uh, free movement of those materials within the internal market and uh, as an impediment to market access. And this is why we, we envy quite a lot what has been achieved so far for glass, um, I would say, for, for the materials. Um, for a more practical standpoint, um, I think it's, it's a key to reward quality. We, we see that if we want to move towards a more circular economy, we need to recycle more. That's, that's a key element, but we also need to make sure that we are getting the right quality to uh, basically provide the raw materials that are being needed to make products. So um, since we will have tighter quality uh, specification or, or standards in the near future, it's also essential to make sure that this is being rewarded. And that should also go with a much wider uh, market access. And here, EU-wide end of waste criteria are absolutely essential to have a well-functioning market for, for recycling within, uh, within Europe. And I think, and this is why I want to, to, to speak a, a bit in the broader terms, uh, this is also more or less using the same recipe that it has been used a couple of decades ago to achieve uh, a free movement of goods within the internal market where we had standardization, technical specification, case law that supported free movement of goods. And if we want now to have more circular value chains, um, and recycle more and substitute more extracted raw materials back into products, we need to have legal certainty. Now, today we have two avenues, just to close the loop, if I may say, national end of waste criteria, which are extremely relevant, especially in some member states, there are specific needs where and, and specific interests for, 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 for those criteria. If I take the example of paper, there, there is still not, unfortunately, harmonized criteria at European level. We see that there are far more uh, that member states and especially large member states are now enacted national end of waste criteria. Uh, it's a positive, uh, it's a positive um, uh, development, but it does not address the internal market issue. And actually, the arrow is not placed on the right bullet point on my slide, so I will correct that. So, uh, on one hand, it's positive to see member states um, laying down more end of waste criteria. On the other hand, we need obviously to make sure that there are consistent across across member states and that they are going to, to, to act as a key. And this is why the best solution is really to move forward with EU-wide end of waste criteria. Now, the criteria, whether at national level or at EU level, are the same and they're overly important. When we are putting forward end of waste criteria, we must have a specific use for um for for, for those end of waste for, for the materials that are reaching end of waste that goes without saying a market there must be technical requirements uh, usually found in the annex of the criteria and make sure that those uses are not going to have a significant harm to human health or the environment all being criteria that are obviously supported by the recycling industry. And just to give an example, we've been working together with the tire industry to uh, propose um, across uh, the value chain harmonized end of waste criteria for tires, which we hope the Commission will be taking over. So now, last but not least, the GRC is working on um, uh, basically prioritizing uh, new EU-wide end of waste criteria. Unfortunately, it's one stream at a time, so it doesn't go sufficiently fast. But it's already a start, um, and uh, this is why we've been working with the GRC uh, for, for following the public consultation that took place uh, back in 2021. So thank you very much. That was trying to zoom in before uh, diving into glass, and I'm obviously available for, for any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks a lot, Emmanuel. Very very useful to have that uh, to have that overview. Um, I, I wonder, is, is one of the issues of behind end of waste um, one of the difficulties that member states might have to recognize uh, something as end of waste? Is it due to a different assessment 
of materials, so it's a kind of a scientific issue, let's say, or is it due to the fear that one member state essentially goes and dumps waste in another member state? Like, what what, what is driving the the difficulty in 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 in, in corresponding assessments between member states? Well, I think I I, I don't know. I, I think that's a question that member states should uh, should answer, but the reality is that you have member states like Italy who have been extremely active in uh, basically devising uh, national end of waste or rendering the EU-wide end of waste criteria uh, binding. Um, and I think that has contributed to legal certainty. And others which, for reasons which I ignore, are uh, basically reluctant. Um, for, from a, from a uh, recycling industry perspective, what matters the most is that obviously we do support national end of waste criteria, but we must find a way where we see that uh, different member states have put forward more or less the same criteria for the same material that there is an harmonization at European level. And here I think the Commission has a key role to play. I took the example of, of paper, but there are plenty of other examples, I would say. And, and I think the criteria that are in the waste stream directive are, are, are the correct ones. We don't want everything and anything to be recognized an, as end of waste. Otherwise, we, we lack credibility. We need to make sure that there is a market, that we are meeting uh, well-established technical, technical specifications or standards, which are recognized by downstream users, and, and that at the end of the day, those end of waste criteria are not going to uh, pose a risk to human health in the environment, which is absolutely essential to make sure that there is at the end of, of the pipe, um, uh, 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 a recognition by consumers that materials used, that, that products using recycled materials can be trusted. So um, I, I think and I hope that there will be a better coordination mechanism by the Commission when the Commission can see, because those national end of waste criteria have to be notified by the to the Commission, that different member states have been putting forward end of waste criteria on the same material. And here we need to have a mechanism whereby they are being recognized across the EU or whereby is actually the, the Commission takes the pen and put forward some harmonized EU-wide criteria together with the industry and obviously with NGOs as well. Okay, thanks uh, thanks so much, Emmanuel, for giving us this uh, this overview. If there are more questions, we'll be sending them to you anyway. Uh, in writing, we'll always try and, and, and answer all the questions from the audience. But thanks for having shared this, this overview. And as you said, it's now time for us to deep dive into the glass-specific uh, end-of-waste criteria with our panel debate. So how has end of waste criteria shaped the circular economy for glass packaging? To answer this big question, I am joined by four representatives of two parts of the glass value chain, the recyclers and the glass manufacturers. I'm joined by Martine Meuse. She is managing director at GRL, Glass Recycling and Logistics. Lucrecia Marin Espinel, she is secretary general of Anarevi, the Spanish Glass Recyclers Federation. Annalena Ikeman, she is Sustainability Director at Ada Glass Packaging Europe. And Stefano Cassano, Director of Production Materials Purchasing at Viralia. So welcome to the four of you and thank you so much for being part of this, of this discussion. Um, to, to kick off, uh, I, I'd like to ask uh, Martine to reflect a little bit on what, uh, on what Emmanuel uh, or, already mentioned that, you know, end of waste for glass is a little bit of a success story. It already has 10 years of existence. But back in 2012, what actually changed for you uh, when the end of waste regulation came into force? Well, I think, Chopul, the, the major change we had as a recyclers uh, was the fact that glass uh, wasn't sold as a waste any longer, but was a material, which makes it much more easier on the administration of uh, of the transport of the the colored and also make it much uh, less expensive because we could avoid some extra admi administrative costs which were related to uh, to waste 
So I think that was the, the major improvement we had with uh, the end of waste that came in 2012. Um, above, what we see that um, which will come is the revision of the actual European legislation on transport of waste that will come in the coming months. And if you see that uh, glass is end of waste at the moment, and if you see also that the goal for the uh, EVOA for the future is to reduce international transport of waste, I think the fact that colored is end of waste is uh, it's only an advantage for us as recyclers and for the whole uh, um, glass sector. Okay, so moving from waste to product solved a lot of these uh, cross-border issues as well. I'm 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 sure. Uh, Lu Lucrecia, from a from a Spanish perspective, what what actually changed? Well, uh, in fact, uh, uh, nearly nothing at a practical level. But uh, we have an increase of administrative burdens, and what end of waste regulation established uh, was a, a clear and uh, an specific way uh, to show the legal void that existed uh, before, and uh, the legal void uh, dealing with some uh, glass culet uh, streams. I mean, for us, the mandatory step of the furnace uh, restricted too much the possibilities to access to other sectors and to reach new opportunities of uh, different uses for recycled glass. Uh, in this way, we could uh, increase the recycling rates and avoiding the landfill as the end of the, of the glass, uh, glass cullet even when production of, no, of new packaging is the main use. Okay. Um, okay, so some, some administrative burden, but still the, the material going uh, to, the, to the glass manufacturing side. Um, Emmanuel mentioned the, the boosting confidence for recycled materials. On the glass manufacturer's side, do you think that end of waste criteria uh, provided somehow more guarantees on the quality of the material that was coming to your to your furnaces. Uh, maybe maybe Stefano first. Yes, uh, the answer is yes, of course. Uh, Emmanuel mentioned uh, the um, end of waste approach criteria as a tool. I like to see it also as a process, uh, the process which allows a waste to be in such a way reconsidered after a process. Uh, as a useful product. What does it mean? The process is notably the remelting of glass. We were used to speak about the secondary raw material at the time. Now, end the waste is the right word. Remelting needs quality because, uh, and it's written in the cri criteria, we need the, uh, the glass cullet must be of a quality suitable to be remelted. So, differently said, the higher the quality, the higher will be the integration rate of the cullet. So, yes, the answer is yes. The end of waste regulation boost in such a way, boosted in such a way, all quality standard of cullet coming from a common effort coming from one side from the treatment facilities and from the other side coming from the knowledge of the users of the glass containers production producers to integrate and to get a higher uptake of cullet integration. Okay, and Elena, would you would you agree with that assessment? Have you seen a, a greater uptake of cullet in, in glass furnaces due to end of waste criteria? Yes, absolutely. I can uh, only agree to what Stefano just explained and said. And um, to that point, I must say that really the the uptake of colored is really an important part of the circular economy on the one hand, but also what we see is required from an industry um, as well and within our um, roadmap and our strategy to achieving um, less carbon emissions. So this is really a crit critical part from a manufacturing point of view, but also in the broader sustainability um, aspect. And I mean, it's been it's been 10 years now that the criteria were set. In the meantime, I, I, I would expect that there have been changes in in sorting uh, techniques, treatment techniques. Um, Martin, would, would you would you say that the end of waste criteria has also pushed the sector to 
do do better to invest more in 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 sorting and treatment has it also had had that that effect well i think the specifications from uh, from the glass industry are at this moment very high and very severe so it pushed our us, us to our limits but it was not really due to the end of waste criteria it's more the specification coming from our customers who push uh, us uh, to our limits and to uh, increase quality that was not really something that uh, was due to the end of waste in my opinion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and lucrecia I agree. I agree absolutely with Martin. The, the, uh, for us, the, 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 when the end of waste criteria was reached before the, the end of waste uh, regulation, and it depends of the, of the client, uh, of course. Uh, I think it was reached before. Okay, so, so Anna Lena, on, on your side, it means that you have more stringent requirements, let's say, for the uptake of colour in furnaces than what end of waste criteria provides. But if you look at it on a European level, do you see differences then in, in different regions of Europe, uh, different ways that the end of waste criteria might have influenced uh, the glass recycling sector? So from my view, I mean, um, within Within our ADA, I mean, we have um, standards across all the different locations and facilities. So um, in my view, um, having a European harmonized approach is definitely helpful in that regard as well, because that will then help us implement our uh, standard approaches um, internally as well. And, and, and Stefano, on, the, on this European perspective, have you seen that in certain regions of Europe, the end of waste criteria might have had more influence on increasing the quality of talent than in others? I would like to see the end of waste criteria as a starting point to go beyond the minimum level that uh, it's written mm -hmm. in the regulation. So I think uh, that's right. Uh, as a starting point, there are countries where the room of improvement might be uh, higher than in other ones. So in my opinion, yes, in such a way, end of waste gave a help gave an indication also regarding a minimum standard of quality everywhere in Europe. Okay, and, and Emmanuel mentioned that you know glass is is only one of the few materials that has achieved a, a European end of waste uh, regulation. I think there are there are metals as well, so it seems to be metals and glass. So why, in your opinion, is glass one of the few materials to have achieved an end of waste agreement? Why why is that the case, uh, Lucrecia? I think, uh, firstly, the glass was the first waste stream to be collected at a household level. It was the beginning of the actual system with containers to collect the individual consumer's voluntary contribution of glass waste. When the single-use packaging, packaging arrives, it was the beginning of the circular economy, in fact, in a great team with the manufacturers, both working together in the same direction. And that's how waste arrives at the plants turning into a resource, uh, a secondary raw material for the production of new containers with a total exploitation and an infinite, an infinitive uh, circularity. Both factors, I think, to be pioneer and the ability to, buy, to be recycled infinitely could be uh, two good reasons for, for, for being the first. OK, so the, this, this endless recycling capacity sort of generates a, a need to have, because basically it means that glass keeps jumping in and out of the waste status effectively as it, as it becomes a product and then a, and then a waste again. Uh, Martin. Well, I think glass is a, is a straightforward product if you compare it with, uh, with other recycled materials, which are from time to time much more complex than, than, than glass. Glass is straightforward, 100% recyclable. If you compare it with paper and cardboard or, or with plastics, which are much more complicated, uh, at my opinion, than glass. Maybe that's the reason why glass is one of the first, together with metal, uh, in, ending, uh, in getting uh, end of waste uh, uh, approval. approval. OK, so, so a simple material, I suppose, helps. It has maybe less challenges to, to, to get to an agreement. But is there, is there anything more, Stefano, that would explain why, why glass is one of the few? 
but I, I, I would uh, think about uh, uh, all, and Emmanuel mentioned that all cross-border movements uh, already in place since a long time. Uh, in, in Europe, there are net glass container exporters uh, and net glass container importer. So that means uh, that in each country, the situation between uh, the availability of cullet and the need of cullet in itself uh, is quite unbalanced. It's not the same contest everywhere. So the end of waste approach uh, gave uh, really a big help in, uh, in such a way, harmonizing all these unbalanced contexts uh, around Europe. So this is, in my opinion, one of the key reasons uh, glass uh, had uh, in the end, uh, more than other materials, uh, the status of end of waste. Okay, Anna Lena, can can you think of uh, of any more reasons? I mean, I'm I'm wondering also whether the the quality of the partnership between between parts of the value chain has does have an effect as well. I mean, there needs to be some ambition to reach these kinds of agreements. Yeah, I mean, for me, really one of the striking points is the permanent material concept that we've mentioned earlier, the infinite recyclability of the material. Um, also, the long standing history, I would say, of the Glass Manufacturing Institute and the entire value chain already being in place. Um, there is a high need, as Stefano put it already, there is a high need for high quality uh, colored, and we would be very happy to to use as much as possible, closing the material loop as much as possible as well, to make the make most out of the material and um, yeah, recycle it infinitely. Okay, and uh, th there's a there's a couple of questions on the actual uh, scope of the of the end of waste criteria. So just to be clear, does the end of waste approval apply to all types of glass? or only clear glass? Is it only maybe for some types of colors? Like, could you, could, could Martin maybe explain, does it cover all glass or are there some types of glass that are excluded from this end of waste criteria? Well, in the end of waste criteria, you have some specific specifications that you have to meet, uh, such as CSP, ferro, ferro contamination and so on. So it relates to, uh, as I, uh, how, I have, how I have understood it, to all types of, uh, of glass, but you need to uh, meet the specifications. Uh, for example, a maximum of 100 grams per C for C CSP, eh? it's the contamination of uh, ceramic, stone and porcelain, um, or ferro, you have a specific standard you have to meet. So I think it's uh, applicable to all kind of uh, types of glass, but you need to meet the specifications. There are also specifications for heat resistant and so on. So if that's heat resistant glass, you cannot use it as end of waste, of course. OK, so it's it's really about contamination uh, and reducing contamination. But on the actual glass that's in there, uh, essentially all all glass is in um, is in scope. Um, the end of waste criteria also sets out some pretty ambitious requirements when it comes to how the glass must be collected. So separately collected and also where it should go, i.e. that the glass should be uh, remelted. And there's a question from uh, Eric uh, Vandenberg in the, in the audience who says, you know, as quality is so important to make this uh, successful, we need the whole stream to be involved, including the collection. So what is your view, a way that we can influence that collection? Has the end of waste criteria influenced collection, the quality of the separate collection? Uh, Lucrecia. Uh, yes, yes, of course. I think it influences uh, in in the in the collection. Uh, there are some specification that should be uh, rated, and it depends of the quality of the glass uh, collected in the containers. Then I think it's it's uh, a big priority the quality of the collection. But would you would you say that end of waste criteria is something that municipalities and other players that are involved in the collection are understanding, or that has it helped shape standards on collection? Maybe uh, Stefano uh, in in Italy, do you have you seen any any improvement on on the collection due to end of waste criteria? Uh, listen, the end of waste criteria uh, by definition sets out uh, some very ambitious requirement, both on separate collection and on remelting. 
this is effect. So in such a way, he couldn't avoid uh, to affect uh, in any way all countries, uh, and in such a way he affected it. Uh, I, I want to say, let's split the two topics. Uh, from one side, separate collection. Glass must be separate collected. No matter with the way we could speak about uh, uh, bottle banks, uh, curbside, this is not the debate today, but as a matter of fact, uh, it has to be collected apart, as a material apart. And this has been done almost everywhere. I would say everywhere. So in such a way, the end of waste criteria affected this process. How much did it affect? I'm not able to answer you, but in such a way he did. Okay, and, and Anna Elena, have you have you seen that end of waste has somehow supported initiatives on on improving um, the the quality of the separate collection? I think that certainly gave an additional, let's say, incentive um, to improve the collection. I mean, speaking from a German perspective, we're quite used to using the bottle bank system that's been um, long established, um, but we do see. Also, to close the loop, we do see more um, engagement on regional level uh, to work on that. Mm -hmm. OK, because because I think it's quite clear that there's a strong incentive from the container glass industry to take up more uh, cullets in, in the production of new bottles. It's it's less clear maybe how the end of waste criteria can support standards on glass collection. Uh, but Martin, maybe you also have a reflection on on that link. You know, has it helped? increase the the kind of standards uh, that municipalities let's say might have on 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 the collection of, of glass well I think in in in, in always uh, it's always uh, effect of been effect that a separate collection of glass helps in the recycling of uh, the glass afterwards because that improves quality the incoming quality of your glass waste um, I'm not really convinced that end of waste was uh, the motivator for municipalities to start up uh, separate collection. Um, I don't think so. I think it's it's more uh, based on on the principle that uh, uh, sorting at the source is the best way to increase uh, recyclability. Yeah, and uh, and I suppose there is there is still uh, some discussion as to how can you reduce the number of contaminants from the beginning at the, at the at the point of collection but then there's also obviously the treatment process that can that can also support that um, do you do you think the end of waste criteria today is still is still relevant with regard to the way that the treatment and the sorting processes have evolved over the past over the past years uh, Lucrecia I think, uh, well, uh, end of waste set the the departing point, uh, in fact. But what really set the quality conditions, as I said before, are the uh, the clients, the manufacturers. In in this case, they set uh, the, the 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 quality required, and we should, we must. Uh, produce a uh, glass uh, collet at that level if uh, if we want to 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 make a good uh, work yeah so um would we would we say then in terms of cross border uh, movements um maybe maybe stefano uh, can can have a go at that one uh, would you if if you were to hierarchize the, the different uh, main benefits, let's say, that end of waste has contributed and something that will never change. Could could that be one of them? The fact that some of the glass has been able to move from one European region to another. I know that there are, for instance, some big differences in the kind of glass that is produced in some regions and the kind of glass that is consumed in those same regions. So it has, has that really helped to create a, a European circular economy for glass? I think uh, the end of waste criteria gave, as I told you before, indeed, a, a boost to cross-border movements uh, uh, because in such a way it facilitated uh, and eliminated any unnecessary formal burden for this movement. A part of that, I don't think that, uh, indeed, uh, the highest level of quality have been affected uh, 
from the est and the waste point of view. I, I as Martin said before, I, I fully agree with her. Uh, all highest quality standard we are living today and the ones we will live tomorrow uh, depends on the market and on uh, the demand in terms of quality of the market. Again, mm -hmm. the end of waste was a starting point, but just a starting point. And in my view, just to answer your previous question, uh, end of waste criteria is uh, 10 years old. We know it. In 10 years, uh, technology improved. In 10 years, mm -hmm. know-how improved. It's not the same as before. So I think in, in, in such a way there are some room of improvement uh, to these criteria to really better match the technology and the know-how existing today. Okay, and I and I will want to get back to this notion of improvement towards the end of our of our discussion. I think we've we've reached a good understanding of what end of waste has has achieved and how it's contributed to set a kind of a minimal uh, threshold, but that in the relationship between recyclers and manufacturers, there are additional uh, requirements. Um, and that brings me to a, another area because end of waste is also mentioned in the packaging uh, and packaging waste uh, legislation, the European legislation, as a means to also account for materials as recycled when it comes to member states reporting on their recycling rates. Um, but what's interesting is that on the one hand, you have end of waste criteria for glass that is only attributed to materials that are sent to remelt. And on the other hand, in the, in the way that member states are reporting on recycling rates, you have additional destinations for that glass that can be considered as recycling. So do you see some sort of conflict there in the way that these materials are being approached? On the one hand, they can be considered as recycled for the purpose of a recycling rate. On the other hand, they cannot be considered as end of waste materials when it comes to the end of waste criteria if they're not being sent to remelt. I'd like to get a bit of a, a sense from you on whether you see that as a, as a conflict, as a contradiction, or do you see that as a natural part of the, of the system? Uh, Martin, maybe a comment from, from you. That's a difficult one, Jean Paul. <laughs> well, um, we try. We try and tackle everything here. <laughs> That's a very difficult one. Um, I think uh, end of waste is is indeed only to remelting, and at the moment there are still other application where applications where where our colour is not going to a remelter and it's still uh, recycling. So there is a not really a conflict, but maybe it's an, uh, an opportunity, for opportunity when we look at the actual end of waste uh, regulation uh, of the ten, 10 years, when we need to revise it, we have to take into account some extra, uh, uh, extra uh, possibilities uh, for recycling. That's something we can, uh, we can look at uh, for the future. Okay, uh, Lu Lucrecia, because I think also in your initial uh, introduction, you, you, you mentioned these different uh, destinations. How, how have you mm. view this, you know, from, from your Spanish perspective? Do you see that as a conflict or a contradiction? Yes, I agree absolutely with Martina. I don't think it's a contradiction, but I think it's something where we must uh, advance. I mean, uh, even if we know uh, the, the, the manufacturers of new packaging is the main use for the glass colored. Uh, uh, there is uh, another uses, another destinations that evade the landfilling and increase, could increase the recycling rate and uh, that the e should to, to be recognized at end of uh, waste criteria. I think it's uh, an opportunity due to the improves in the technology to, uh, to different uh, things uh, to, to revise the, this criteria. Okay, uh, Anna, Anna Lena, would you would you agree with this uh, with this assessment that the that the end of waste criteria should be maybe uh, more more open than than simply remail, or do you reckon that? You know, reporting on recycling rates on the one hand and achieving end of waste status on the other are actually two separate things. Well, from my perspective, um, yes, it's of course for us as the manufacturer favorable if we have as much material 
available as possible. But um, as said earlier already, the key really is to avoid landfilling for coloured. To achieve um, again the circularity of that, but of course, yeah, um, taking up more materials is absolutely priority for us. Okay, and 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 Stefano, maybe maybe also a, a comment from from you. Yes, I will answer your tricky question, uh, Jean Paul. <laughs> uh, in, in my view, uh, the end of waste criteria and on, on on this topic uh, shouldn't change. In my view, the real recycling idea uh, meets only remelting. Then we can discuss about remelting in a closed loop bottle to bottle or to other application, always remelting because there's also fiberglass or flat glass. We can't forget them to a different extent, of course, but uh, they do exist and they do remelt. But uh, when it comes to other applications like uh, just to, to underline an example, aggregates. I wouldn't like to speak about recycling in that case, but just recovery. And recycling is not recovery. There are two different things. So this is something I wouldn't change in the criteria at all. So may, maybe there's a, a distinction here between what, what one might account for as recycling in a, let's say, in an administrative manner, which could have some recovery type applications there for whatever political reason. Um, but then there's also an, an industrial route and that industrial route is actually much more connected to uh, to remelt. And these two these two concepts actually might be able to, to, to coexist. I think that's what you're that's what you're saying, Stefano. Um, in terms of these other applications, so specifically, let's say construction materials, uh, Martin, do you do you do you see any applications requesting cullet and yet it might be difficult for them to have access to that cullet because it's still a waste material. Do you see any issues there in the market where some applications would benefit to have access to a product as opposed to a waste? Well, uh, there are some residual colored streams which are not uh, quality. If you look at the quality, which are not applicable for remelting and can be used in other uh, uh, applications now at the moment that's waste and uh, for certain uh, uh, customers who ask for that kind of products uh, for, for certain uh, applications they cannot use it because it's still waste because we are not allowed to use it because it's still waste and I think that's a pity because then it needs to go needs to be landfilled um, mm. while there were other applications possible just in, in, in practice, but not uh, on the legal side because it's waste. And, and is this then still a, still a reality that we, that we need to, to, to fight against, that there is still glass uh, going uh, to, to, to landfill? Uh, Lucrecia, from a, from a Spanish perspective, is that, is that still a, a reality? We try to avoid it, but there is some stream uh, collet, collet streams that are not able to remelt because of the quality and that could be useful for another uses. I mean, uh, decorative, uh, decorative uh, ceramics, uh, water filtrations, uh, etc. that they are uh, um, culet streams not able to introduce in the foreigners. But it doesn't mean they must be to the to landfilling. Then, if we can't do anything to uh, to to do with uh, these uh, streams, why not? Yeah, and 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 I think it also comes back then to the point made by Anna Lena around availability. Uh, and I, I I'd, I'd like to maybe also get a sense of that because if there is material that is going to other types of applications, that will also probably affect the availability of material. At the same time, Anna Lena, I suppose you're talking about availability mm -hmm. of a quality uh, material. Could you could you just comment yeah. on on that a little bit further? Well. Um... Well, the, the availability of coloured is obviously key to the process um, as such. It's, it helps us to have stable processes. But on the other hand, it's really important from a higher sustainability agenda 
point of view because it saves a lot of energy and that in turn saves a lot of CO2, which will help us achieve the um, net zero target we're all working on. So I think, um, yeah, that's that's really a critical part within within the broader sustainability um, roadmap that we are looking for. OK, and, and, and Stefano, on this question of the availability of quality material, and you talked about the improvements on, on sorting and treatment, uh, can you reflect on, I don't know, maybe some projects or some ideas that also the glass manufacturers are investing in to ensure that there is, in fact, more uh, quality material? Because I understand from, from Martin and Lucrecia that you're also setting very high standards, which is normal in an industrial per process, but surely you're also working on making sure there is more and more material available that meets those standards. I think Martina and Lucrezia are right. Uh, we need to be realistic in such a way. If there are some, let's say, some quality of cullet that can't be used by uh, glass manufacturers, uh, of course, instead of landfilling, we need, we must find other solutions. So on this point of view, fully agree with them. On the other way around, uh, uh, I would revert the answer saying that uh, today there are applications uh, that are using, and uh, I'm coming back to backfilling, not left feeling, uh, backfilling, uh, which uh, could be in such a way more likely addressed to remelting, just to look at that quality. And uh, to answer your question, uh, I would notably speak about fines. Today, the finest part of the cullet uh, is something that has to be treated. Uh, Better and better. It was not the case 10 years ago, but it's the case today because there's the knowledge and that's the technology. And so from the treater's point of view, there is the possibility to higher the level of quality of this fine part. And from the user's point of view, there's the possibility to use it. So in my opinion, this will be the challenge from here on. One of the challenges from here on. OK, that's uh, that's interesting. I, I'd like to maybe also get a comment from from Martin on, on, on that on that challenge. Uh, do, do you agree with 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 that challenge and that assessment? I absolutely absolutely agree with uh, with Stefano, because uh, I think fines, it's, it's something which is very hot at the moment. Um, I think we as recyclers, we need to look for some innovative ways of on, on how we can uh, meet specifications on the fines. But on the other hand, um, the glass producers. I think it's 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 a partnership we're in, and we have to look together how we can increase uh, um, the colored uh, amounts by looking at specifications for fines on one side, and maybe to to go to bit to be a, a bit m less strict on how they are at the moment. The glass producers, and from our side, we as recyclers, we need to be innovative and uh, and look how we can uh, make good material out of the fines. So I fully agree. I think it's a partnership between the two, both of us. Lucrecia, a reflection also from Spain on on this on this fines uh, the, the the fines issue within within glass recycling. Yes, yes, I absolutely agree with the the affirmations of my colleagues. Uh, should be should be done. Okay. I, I have a question from uh, Veronica. It's a very specific question, so I don't know, maybe, maybe Martin uh, can have a go at it. Um, is the PSL label, I think that's pressure sensitive label, I believe. Uh, are you aware of that? Do you, do you know whether that's a problem for, for glass recycling? Uh, so I, I suppose it labels applied to, to packaging. Uh, is that considered as a, as a contaminant? Is that something that needs to be worked on? Martin, Stefano, uh, does anyone know? How to answer Veronica? I let you the floor, <laughs> Thank <Martin>. you, Stefano. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what the PSL label is, but labeling, of course, it's uh, it's also something which brings a lot of discussions. Um, and I think we are talking with a lot of people uh, about labeling. First of all, is the glue that uh, that is used, mm -hmm. and secondly, is the type of labeling. But I'm not aware mm. of the PSL of how is it, how is it called uh, label? What is what that precisely is? I have no idea. Maybe Stefano Stefano knows. Uh, me, me neither, indeed. Okay. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> when it comes to label, and uh, if we speak about paper, label of paper, uh, it it uh, uh, as a consequence, uh, it affects in such a way the organic content of the cutlet, uh, and so the way 
with such an organic content, the users can manage this quality. So the less organic content is inside, the better will be to use. And uh, this machine, I guess, is one of the tools of the equipment uh, which is able in such a way to take away this label from, from the container. This is what I, I think could be the, the answer to the question. Okay, so it's, it's pressure sensitive label. That's what we mean by PSL. Um, so I, I hope that answers uh, that answers that question. I think we have about uh, five five minutes, so I, I'd like to um, um, start to close uh, this this discussion. Um, maybe one specific question to Lucrecia and Martin on the current way the end of waste criteria is being applied, whether it's on European level, whether it's by member states. Do you come across any specific issues? that you feel you would like to raise here that has been a problem in, you know, a barrier or an, on, on movement of, 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 of waste materials or end of waste materials. Uh, Martin, is there anything you'd like to raise at this point? Well, I just, I've mentioned it before. Uh, I think we have to look uh, on, on the definition of end of waste because today there are applications which are still not within the end of waste uh, certification. So I think we have to look there and thinking about is it only remelting or not. So sorry, Stefano, I know you're uh, you're <laughs> you're a, a, a fan of only the remelting. And secondly, just a small, it's 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 something very small. Um, we have we get a yearly audit on uh, the end of waste certification. Maybe the integration in the in the existing audit uh, certification sets ISO uh, 9001 and something like that or something like that. Maybe that would uh, would uh, make it easier because it's 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 quite a complicated process we have to go through every year. Um, and I think the specifications that we need to meet, given by our customers, already gives a uh, gives set up call it as a high standard. So maybe we have to look at uh, the certification process and the audit process we have to go through uh, um, uh, every year. Uh, so to make it much more uh, easier and and um, yeah, that's but that's some just a small comment on it. It's not that key. Okay. Okay, uh, Lucrecia, in, in Spain, in the way end of waste criteria is implemented, any specific issues that you have faced that you would like to raise here? Uh, for us, uh, the, uh, I think the, the, the main thing is to avoid the, 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 the legal void, uh, because in fact, uh, they, they, use, uh, they use the glass colored for another uses, but we have some complications with the certification of the end of waste, and uh, they should be uh, legally. I mean, they should be re uh, regulated uh, in a in a clear way. Okay. Hmm. Okay, that's uh, that's clear, Stefano. Uh, Anna Elena, have you experienced any specific issues with the way end of waste criteria has been applied? And that you would like to raise here? Uh, I let you the floor, Anna, Anna before. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, well, from my experience, not really. Um, so, well, Stefano. <laughs> uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, when I uh, told about, I mentioned about uh, the possibility, the room of improvement of the of, of the, the the criteria. Indeed, uh, I was thinking about some technical limitation might be might might change uh, to let's say to match the reality today uh, versus what happened ten years ago, uh, and notably uh, regarding fines. But this is uh, a, a very uh, let's say precise topic. Uh, topic uh, I would like to 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 explain right now. But uh, indeed, uh, only some technical limitation might be let's say in such a way improved. Uh, uh, coming back uh, just uh, uh, one second to 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 remelting because I know it's quite a sensitive matter. Uh, the the target, my target, is to emphasize that the only way to be sustainable. Uh, is uh, and this is uh, not only an engagement also an obligation is uh, to reduce our co2 emissions uh, and remelting is uh, the only way to reduce emissions so that's why i'm insisting on that uh, all other applications are feasible but uh, to a different extent uh, this is what i want to say 
Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Stefano. So I think we're gonna uh, we're gonna wrap up on 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 that note. I would like to give each of you uh, a, a thirty second reflection, just to, just to wrap up on this uh, on this debate, uh, with essentially this question. You know, is the current end of waste criteria still fit for purpose to reach our twenty thirty target of ninety percent glass collection for recycling? in a container glass manufacturing loop. So, uh, Martin, do you think end of waste criteria is still fit for purpose for that objective? 30 seconds. I think it's still fit to purpose. I'm, uh, um, as I already told uh, in the beginning of, the, of this uh, conversation, I think for the, the, the major improvement for us was uh, the fact that we are uh, um, uh, making products and materials and not uh, making a uh, waste or uh, of producing waste or recycling we recycle waste to to a material i think as an image for a company for a recycling company when we can say that we make a new raw material or a new material it's uh, just as image it's uh, it's for us very important uh, also for the image of the recycling sector um, so for us end of waste it's something uh, please keep it for glass it makes life a bit more easier. Um, so from my point of view, um, let's go forward. And maybe uh, to make a small update, as Stefana already uh, said, but because it's in, in the meanwhile 10 years old, um, but uh, keep on going, I would say. Great, thanks so much, uh, Martin, for having shared your views on this, on this panel. Uh, Lucrecia, is it still fit for purpose? 30 seconds. Yes, I think it fits to the purpose, but it's essential to guide to span the end of waste criteria. For us, uh, well, in the in the sense we have uh, already explained, uh, to look for another uses, to promote or to encourage the research and development, and uh, and uh, to to set the legal uh, frame clear for new application respecting the environment, the human life, and uh, and setting another uses to avoid the landfilling. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Lucrecia, for having given that that perspective from from Spain. Anna Lena, is it still fit for purpose? Yeah, I can only agree. It's still fit for purpose. It's a, it's a very big part of um, the importance of glass. There is a lot more to it. It's consumer education to recycle, um, the overall goal to increase the recycling rates. But uh, certainly the end of waste criteria helps to facilitate European um, availability of the material, good quality material, which will help us as the manufacturers to remelt the colored um, and in turn helps us to achieve um, CO2 reduction and uptake of the material and avoid landfilling. Nice wrap up. Thank you so much, uh, Annalena, for having shared uh, your views on, on the panel. Uh, and, and Stefano, is it still fit for purpose? I know you've made already several, several comments in that direction, so I expect a, a, a positive answer. No, no, my, my answer will be positive also because all good answers have, have been already given. Uh, just to add something, yes, we need this tool. We need it and we still need it. And we will need this tool to recycle more and better. So uh, welcome to this tool. Hopefully, as I told you, some rumors of improvement, but uh, no matter with that, we need this tool and uh, I'm happy to to, 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 to give you, uh, I, I hope, a positive answer that way. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stefano. I think we've got a bit more insights now on, on these two parts of the chain that are, that are working hand in hand to deliver on this 90% objective that, uh, that we all have uh, inside Close the Glass Loop. And hopefully it's also been useful for the audience to get to hear more from you on, on the importance and the role of end of waste criteria. And there's also, uh, as you saw, a global audience. So maybe there are regions around the world that are also thinking about setting up these kind of minimum standards that, that help to, to push the circular economy forward. So thanks a lot to the, to the four of you for having been part of this. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. And so we now move on to our best practice presentation.
And for this best practice presentation, we travel to Madrid, uh, where we are joined by Carmen Jimenez Melgosa. She is Communications and Sustainability and Responsibility Coordinator for Perno Ricard uh, España. And she will talk to us about uh, this campaign, Recicla la Noche. It's, it's only just getting dark uh, here in, in, in Brussels, so we're getting ready for, for a night. Uh, and so we'll be hearing about what this campaign is all about and how it's contributing to closing the, the glass loop. Uh, Carmen, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Jean Paul, for inviting me to this to this um, loop and to be able to share these um, these best practice. Um, I, I'm trying to put my yeah here it is. Um, I just want to um, thank you also for letting me to learn from all of you. I'm not expert of glass recycling. I'm just in communication and sustainability and responsible coordination. Uh, but it is really useful to understand how the situation is and to try to improve for the better for the future. And um, well, um, I'm just uh, part of Pernorikar and just to uh, place me, uh, this is the um, number two worldwide producer of wine and spirits with present in more than 160 markets and I'm in the Spanish affiliate. Uh, with uh, more than 500 employees working to connect brands, hospitality sector and consumers. And here I just put some of our brands to, um, for you to more or less understand who we are. And uh, part of, um, of our commitment, uh, well, we have a huge and um, tangible uh, roadmap that it is called Good Times from a Good Place. Uh, we started in 2019 to this whole roadmap with uh, real projects and different uh, goals to try to achieve and some of them they are already achieved and others we have to uh, keep working until uh, 2030 and our uh, claim for employees clients and consumers is that the importance of taking care of each other and that's where we exactly have this project called Recicla Noche or in in English it's Nights Joint Recycling and um, this is a um, project that it is not just from Pernorica, Spain. It is uh, uh, in collaboration with an association called Noche Madrid or Madrid's Night. And it's, uh, it joins all the uh, night bars and pubs from the, um, from the city uh, with, the, with, uh, with the idea to uh, create awareness and also educate bartenders about the importance of recycling while uh, they are working during the night. When, um, and also for consumers, because our objective is both, for both targets, because local bartenders need to know how to recycle glass or separate carton or uh, other things, but also consumers uh, have an important uh, role here and uh, we want to foster and award them. And we started on 2016 uh, for six years, but we had to stop uh, for uh, by the pandemic situation. All the hospitality sector was closed, so it was really difficult to do our work. But I would like to uh, explain you how it is. Um, we work in the um, in the uh, environmental, social and economical uh, way. But for this, I wanted to focus on the uh, environmental one that we have a recycling squad, a social uh, sociological study and some annual awards. And these are the three key actions that we do during this project. First of all, we have this squad that are people, volunteers that are already um, trained in, um, in recycling processes and uh, they visit different locals in Madrid just to, um, to talk with the bartenders because we saw that many times we talk in general, but we don't really go to deep deeply to see what is happening with each one. For example, some of them said, yeah, we put some beans, but in the same time, um, we cannot go there because there are uh, consumers around or there are many traffic. So to understand what are uh, the really important uh, things that are happening and also to cons uh, to, um, to talk with uh, consumers. And after two months, we come back to see if uh, things are being changing or not. This is not quantitative, it's qualitative totally, but um, we try to uh, be uh, with them there. 
The second one is the sociological study that mainly it's the core of all this project because uh, we take information and data from bartenders and consumers and um, we try to understand uh, what is uh, their concerns and what is really happening and this can be a tool for institutions or for other uh, companies to understand how we have to change. Sadly, we didn't have uh, more studies just from 2019 because we uh, prepared that on March. And as you know, with pandemic situation, we couldn't uh, do it on 2020. And on 2021, at first, everything was already um, closed. So it was really difficult to do it. But uh, we are working for uh, preparing for the 2022. And I just wanted to put this to picture that People are already um, know the situation, but many of them, for example, say that it's difficult, complicated, or when you are in your uh, business, you know that that's important, but in the daily day, you actually don't know how to do that and you forget it. So um, all this information is really important for uh, people. And um, the last one, it's the Recycle uh, Recycla Not Awards. Uh, we uh, try to... Um, give people um, like or well, sorry, uh, recognize through these awards the best practices in terms of sustainability and responsibility um, and also around social and economic uh, things uh, for locals, organizations, regional governments. And this is the annual moment where we really put on the map what we are doing. But um, and we also work with some of our uh, clients and with NGOs to um, to help us and try to make it bigger. But this year, sadly, we cannot we couldn't do um, something like that because all the hospitality sector was closed. But instead, we turn it in solidarity through the prizes award. Um, all that people that helped to resist this uh, nightlife because. The first of all, you said, OK, COVID, you close the, the pubs and clubs. So they were uh, really harmed. And also in Spain, we where we have the most number of uh, pubs in the world. So <laughs> it was um, a really complicated situation for us. And uh, I just wanted to say here that uh, also from our side, in Pernodica, Spain, and the communication part that I am part of, uh, we tried to make it bigger and try to um, uh, to turn it to something more closer uh, also to young adults, because if we want to talk with consumers, but consumers are not, um, they are actually in the in the pubs. So we have to uh, use the social media, micro-influencers, to talk in the same language as they talk and try to understand that this is not something weird, that this is actually something that they can um, do when they are going outside, for example. And... Um, to summarize, I will say that this is this project. It's really important for us and for uh, also for Madrid. First of all, to create value to our clients, because uh, we, uh, as companies, we have a big impact on um, the community, and we have to build the future of the hospitality. And I think one of that part is uh, creating awareness and giving them tools to already make it uh, happen. And um, that is connected with the second one that awareness and education is super important because uh, not is the theory it's also the practice part and consumers uh, have a huge role here everything uh, it's about consumers and uh, lastly about the impact of our actions as we said we are taking care of each other as huge company and the same as others we have a role in the society so we actually need to care about this so um, these projects help us to try to get involved with the community. And lastly, I just wanted to say that uh, from Bernard Ricard, uh, Spain and from the group Bernard Ricard, uh, this is just an example of what we work. But we also try to uh, make things better and try to, um, to achieve uh, our goals uh, also because we know that we put a lot of glass in the market and we put a lot of brands and uh, we have to try to reduce our impact or have a positive impact. So I just uh, put some examples, for example, our absolute bottle, it's 80% recycled glass or uh, we change all our local uh, brand called Rua Vieja 
just to uh, be 100% uh, sustainable. And this is for our brands, but also inside we have tools to reduce our um, impact as for example, the Seiko pack tool that uh, we want to make on 2025 that all our packaging will be recyclable, compostable and reusable. And for that, we are uh, 18,000 employees. So it's really difficult to coordinate all the affiliates and uh, things like this. Um, they are really challenged for us, but we will try it. And lastly, we have this the World Bar of Tomorrow. This is a project uh, coordinated also with Recicla Noce to um, um, to um, make uh, hot, uh, bartenders more sustainable and more responsible, also doing uh, sustainable cocktails to reduce all what, what they use and to be also responsible with the consumers. So, um, yeah, this is all from my side. I hope um, you enjoy it, you like it. And uh, thank you so much, Jean Paul, again. No, thanks, uh, thanks, Carmen, for, for sharing this um this best practice. Uh, it's really interesting for us because we we have a lot of work uh, planned uh, for the Horeca uh, channel inside uh, Close the Glass Loop, and I think your your initiative is is, is very interesting for, for us to, to learn more. And that's actually my my question to you: is the the information and the knowledge that you're gathering within this initiative, especially in contact with bartenders, consumers who are active uh, at night, uh, how are you then sharing this information with the rest of the you know, glass collection and, and recycling value chain, let's say. Is there a kind of a sharing mechanism? I'm thinking extended producer responsibility schemes like Ecovidrio, for instance, in Spain, who are also very active on these kinds of issues. Is there some sharing of information? Uh, and, and can we learn more? Yeah, um, right now, uh, actually not in this moment, because um, we were focused on uh, just on Madrid, so it's something quite a small, it's not for all Spain, and also we work for consumers and bartenders, but uh, from Bernard Ricard, yes, we are part of Ecovidio, we collect with them and we contribute with them, and for sure this is one of the ways that we are studying to spread all this information, because we think that it is not only for Madrid, it's going to be for all Spain, and also maybe this information could be really helpful for other uh, people of the um, other companies or other institutions for uh, the value chain. So for sure, we are looking to try to spread this information in the future. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's really interesting, and, you, and you've already done done a part of that here here today, and hopefully we'll have further opportunities inside inside close the glass loop that will that will allow that to to happen. Hureka, as I said, is a very specific uh, channel. It's almost like big mega households, you know, each each bar consuming a lot uh, of, of of products packed in glass. So it's definitely something of interest to us. I think it's really difficult, uh, this uh, sector, the Eureka sector, it's really complicated because bars used to be small and they are not big companies. And when you have a small uh, uh, company or business, you focus on you, what you need. So recycling, sometimes it's in a second um, floor. So it's difficult, but we will work on it for sure. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen, for having shared this uh, best practice with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so we now move to the last part of our session today, which is the Q&A, a special open Q&A with Vanessa Schinnel. So Vanessa, Senior Product Policy Manager at Feve, you know Vanessa, she's part of all our episodes, always sharing the latest on uh, Close the Glass Loop, and this time we decided to have an open Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions in the Slido, then please put them in there, we can, we can pick up on them. Uh, and I have already been looking a little bit through some of the social media on LinkedIn, on Twitter, to see if there have been any conversations in the past where questions were raised. And there was, in fact, one uh, conversation. Uh, it was talking about uh, should close the glass loop not communicate more about the actual benefits uh, of glass recycling uh, to consumers, you know, so that they understand better why they should recycle their glass. Is that something for close the glass loop uh, moving forwards, Vanessa? Yeah, so thank you very much, John Paul, for the question. Uh, good afternoon to everyone and Happy New Year. 
Um, so indeed, that's a very important uh, question because consumers, as we all know, play a very uh, important role in the, the collection of, of glass packaging. Uh, and what we are trying to do within Close the Glass Loop is to provide a platform uh, to gather some of the best uh, performing communications programs and share these ideas. And actually, uh, what Carmen presented just before is a, is a great uh, example of, uh, of that. Uh, and clearly, there are a few aspects that we want to explore within Close the Glass Loop. So one is to how can we give citizens clear uh, sorting uh, guidelines that are really adapted uh, to the specificities of the area, for example, uh, historical city center, uh, to the typology of housing or to the waste producer uh, itself. So household or ORECA, it's not the same as we just uh, heard. Um, so this will ensure that we collect more, but also uh, better glass. But also what we uh, see is that citizens are really uh, concerned over their impact on the, the planet and they want to take uh, action to uh, reduce their environmental footprint. And when it comes to waste, uh, it seems more and more important that uh, the value chain explains uh, the positive environmental uh, impact of uh, proper sorting uh, behavior. Uh, behaviors and in that sense uh, Close the Gas Soup can also provide uh, a platform uh, where we share the communication tools uh, that can be used to really motivate uh, consumers but also share on what are the messages uh, that are most uh, effective to, to, to convince them. Uh, so just to give you an example we, we usually say that uh, by recycling glass in the EU over 20 12 uh, million tons of raw materials are saved each year and over 7 uh, million tons of CO2 are avoided. So I think we can all understand that these are huge uh, numbers, but the question is whether we, uh, these figures, um, talk to citizens. Uh, can we uh, really figure out what they represent? So how can we convert these figures into something that is really concrete uh, and, and meaningful uh, in terms of the benefits that uh, recycling uh, provides? And that's uh, definitely something that we can uh, we can dis discuss uh, within Close the Glass Loop for the benefits of, uh, of everyone. OK, uh, thanks. That's uh, as we're always doing this kind of sharing of, of information. Maybe there are there are some you know, best practices also in communicating to, to citizens that we can that we can support. Um, another big question that often arises in, uh, in in social media is around reuse. You know, people say, yeah, but close the glass loop. You're only focusing on recycling. You should do more on reuse. So what role will this platform play on reuse? Yeah, so reuse is a very topical uh, issue and there is a lot of uh, interest. Uh, but Close the Glass Loop it aims to achieve 90% collection for recycling by 2030. So, of course, our primary focus is uh, on recycling. But that being said, uh, if uh, you have a look at our uh, European Action Plan, it's, it also highlights uh, what, uh, waste prevention as a, as a focus uh, area for the, for, for the platform. And also what I think is very interesting since we, we launched Close the Glass Loop in June 2020, that in our discussions, we see that even though we focus on recycling, uh, we also have to take into account uh, reuse when we explore uh, recycling um, uh, aspects. And uh, I'll give you two, uh, two examples. Uh, first, reuse uh, will play a key role or will play a role in the achievement of the uh, recycling targets that are in the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive, because basically member states uh, that have a reusable system in place can deduct up from uh, uh, up to 5% from their recycling uh, targets. So from a statistical perspective, it's really important to understand how uh, refillable packaging is accounted for uh, in the glass recycling rate, because that has an impact on the uh, glass recycling uh, rate. Uh, so that's the first example. And the second one is that um, our, one of our key priorities is the uh, horeca sector, uh, so hotels, cafes and, and restaurants. Uh, and for that, we really try to understand really the, the dynamics of this, uh, of this uh, channel. And for that, we really have to take into account the prevalence of, of reuse, because in a number of countries, and especially for the horeca sector, uh, reuse is uh, an important part of uh, glass packaging 
that is being uh, consumed actually. Um, so this is something that we have to take into account if we want actually to improve uh, the recycling performance of, uh, of, of this channel. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I don't see any uh, particular questions coming in from the audience. So maybe just uh, you'll have uh, uh, not much more than 30 seconds, but just maybe for everyone to know what's coming up this year in terms of policy that might affect the way this platform will uh, you know, achieve its objectives of, on, on glass recycling. Is there anything in the pipeline that people would need to know? Like top level, 30 seconds. Yeah, so our platform is very much driven by uh, the, the target that is set in the packaging and packaging waste uh, directive. So 75% uh, of glass packaging has to be uh, recycled by 2030. So that's really our main a uh, piece of legislation, and it will actually be reviewed uh, this year to ensure that all packaging placed on the market uh, are reusable or recyclable in an economically viable uh, manner by 2030. So as such, uh, the review will not uh, change the recycling uh, targets for uh, our various uh, packaging materials, but it's likely to address some uh, aspects that can be linked to the work of Close the Glass Loop. Uh, so reuse that we mentioned, waste prevention, uh, recycled content or recyclability. So as Close the Glass Loop, we are not an advocacy group, um, so we don't have a position on that directive, uh, but I'm sure that many of the partners will uh, closely follow uh, those discussions. And if uh, there is a link with our daily activities, uh, then we can uh, discuss and, and Close the Glass Loop is here as well to, uh, to help that discussion. Okay, perfect. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, uh, Vanessa, for having Thank shared you. those answers with us. Uh, there's often a lot of questions on the on the social media, so I hope that helps some of you get get a bit of an answer from from Close the Glass Loop. So we have come to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for having attended. We will be back end of March, 31st of March. So save the date, and we will be communicating very soon on the topics and the speakers. Until then. Take care and see you at episode six. Bye-bye.